Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here at the Reagan National Defense Forum at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library in Simi Valley, California. Our coverage here is sponsored by Boeing and Leonardo DRS, and I can't think of a better way to kick this off with Peter Hulkvist, who's Sweden's uh, Defense Minister. Sir, it's always an honor and pleasure to see you. Thanks very much for joining us. No, thank you for, for the possibility to meet. Um, so tell us why it's important for you to be here and the message that you hope this uh, American security audience takes away. It happens a lot now in the security questions around in all of the world and you, you, United States is a key player in this. And what United States uh, says, what United States do, make a great impact different levels in the world. What I think is very important for me to message in here today is that we must see what's happened in our part of Europe with a neighborhood that have the security situation have been worse over time. And if we see Georgia 2008, Crimea 2014, war going on in Ukraine, um, military upgrading from the Russian side, more complex exercises and more and more of the different sort of things that happened. Uh, big exercises like Ocean Shield as an example with 50 aircraft, 50 naval vessels in the Baltic Sea, in the Norwegian Sea and in the Northern Sea. Uh, some sort of very complex uh, uh, exercise signaling that uh, they, they, they w want to be real uh, a part in this part of Europe. And we must respond in some way with balancing exercises. So we also see say, says that uh, we need, we have our right, we have our sovereignty, we have our right to, to decide about our future. So all this that's happened just now with exercises, with annexation of Crimea, with the disinformation campaigns, with all these activities to split the Western world in Europe, we must also see that the democratic values, we must stand up for them and defend them. And that is a very important message from my side on this conference. Um, did, it, did you find it worrying? I mean, the, in the first panel uh, of the discussion, it was Jonathan Carl, Carl Rove, Bill Brown from uh, L3 Harris, uh, Tammy Duckworth, and Liz Cheney, uh, Congresswoman, uh, the Vice President's daughter. And one of the poll results was that an alarming number of Americans, or I think it should be maybe concerning, is it that some 23% or so of Americans uh, see Russia as, a, as more of an ally than an enemy? I have a I don't talk about Russia as ally or enemy. I talk about uh, the things that they're doing and the facts that happen in our neighborhood. We should not have a naive view of Russia. Uh, we must be strong. We must stand up for, for international law and order. We must do, op, st stand up for human rights. If we do not then, then authoritarian forces uh, stepping forward. And we've seen also that uh, the Russian government that they are ready to use military goals to fulfill political ambitions. So we have a new situation here and I think that all democratic countries must take this challenge seriously and act together and be united because it's a question of the values and how the world will, will be in the future, what we show the world we are going to live in. Um, but there are uh, friends of mine, for example, in Europe who look at the political situation in the United States. They observe some of the comments the American president has made uh, that they see as being much more pro-authoritarian than pro-democratic nations, uh, pressing everybody on 2%. Everybody understands, but there are nations that contribute to security even though they don't spend 2%. Sweden doesn't spend 2%, but it's an increasingly important American strategic partner. And then a concern that, for example, congressmen um, in order to protect the president, for example, are accepting a Russian narrative that it was Ukraine that interfered in 2016 instead of uh, Moscow. Do you think that this undermines that sort of strategic cohesion you think is important to stand up to authoritarian regimes? Uh, first of all, Sweden, Finland, we cooperate a lot. We invest more and more and step up, step upgrading our military capability. So we do from our uh, position what we can just now. We, we will take a new defense decision next year from the Swedish side 
that we will invest around 25 billion Swedish crowns in five years. So we upgrade and I think it's necessary to be stronger and I'm positive that different European countries spend more money on defense because it makes the threshold also higher and it's also important to exercise together to build interoperability because that also makes the threshold higher and it creates a very clear security signal. That's one part of it and we see the transatlantic link is very important and we see that it works because uh, the agreements we have done with the United States, it's delivered. It's delivered from Pentagon, it's delivered from the armed forces and I see a very open and constructive dialogue. Beside all these other speculations, Twitters and what's happening on other fields on the international arena. So that is one thing we can see in reality and that's very good. Then I think that if we see inside our countries, we see it also in Sweden, we see it in different European countries, that political parties, political leaders have a tendency to accept totalitarian ideas. Then we must attack that and be very clear that we do not want to live in that society. We w must fight for an open democratic society. So we must do it internally, but also towards these countries that try to spread this sort of ideas. Last year, uh, you, uh, there was a tripartite agreement, Sweden, Finland, the United States, to deepen uh, defense cooperation. That's also a key connection, not just uh, to NATO through the U.S. channel, but also through the EU, given both of your EU nations. And then there's the Nordefco uh, cooperative regime that brings the whole region uh, closer uh, together. Update us on where the U.S.-Swedish U.S., Finland, Swedish relationship and the dialogues and discussions you've been having, including with Secretary Esper, as you've worked to advance this partnership? We have done a lot uh, together around exercises. We have um, some examples, Northern Wind. We have um, Baltops, we have Baltic Protector, we have Trident Juncture Cold Response, and we have our Swedish big exercise next year, Aurora 20. We have U.S. participations, we have Finnish participation, we have Swedish participation. I think that when we are doing this together, we also create security in reality because we, then we develop interoperability. I think that is one of the key factors also in the future. So to develop the, the training, the exercises, I think is a key factor. Then we have a, a long tradition of cooperation around material and technical development. That is also something that we can build on and develop. Uh, I think also that we have a, a lot of knowledge about the situation in our neighborhood and in our environment. And that is something we also can share with our American partner and we do it also. So it's an interest for us and it's an interest for the United States. And I think also that this um, way of cooperation we have chosen is very unbureaucratic, it's very fast and it also build a relationship on a personal level and that can be very useful if we need to do something in reality. Um, do you feel that Sweden, which doesn't have a reputation for alliances historically uh, but partnerships, do you think that the US-Swedish partnership is actually advancing US security aims in the Baltic, for example, by enhancing stability? I mean, is that an underlying message that goes from, from your side to the American side and is sort of an understood um, key asset of the relationship? I think it's very positive that the United States is represented in the Baltic republics and I think it's very positive that we from time to time have aircraft from the U.S. side, we have uh, sea vessels from, from the from the U.S. side and that the United States participate in our exercises because all this build a puzzle of a higher level of security and make the threshold higher. So this representation from the U.S. side is very important for us, not only Sweden, also for Finland, for the Baltic states, for, for Poland and for, for the others. So, so this is a, a, a part of a strategy for peace and stability in our part of Europe but also the contribution of Swedish forces to that stability as well. Yeah, we, 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 we can offer to, be, to, partic to participate in exercises, to, to be a partner that can, we can do things together and, and develop capabilities together. But we are not NATO member and we are not uh, in the enhanced forward presence, but uh, it's possible to also uh, develop the 
our relationship to enhance forward presence in some way. But uh, that is a question for the future. I think that uh, what we are doing just now is the smartest way to handle the security situation in our part of Europe. When some, some countries do one thing, others do another thing. But when you see the whole puzzle, you have created a better security situation. Um, let me ask you two questions. More uh, uh, congratulations on being extended as uh, as defense minister in the new government. Uh, there's a defense commission out. Talk to us a little bit. Uh, Sweden in, in its system proposes a strategic plan which lasts over a five-year period of time, and that document is out. And we, this is the first time we're speaking since the report came out. Um, talk to us a little bit about the key priorities of this government going forward. Uh, we have got the report from the defense commissions. We have uh, made an analysis of it from the armed forces about the economical situation and how, how we should make practice of this report. Now we will start the process with, with negotiations next year and step by step uh, look at the army, navy and the air force and then we will create a bill to the parliament and I think uh, it will be decided next autumn and it will be valid from the 1st of January 2021 and uh, the amount of money we have, 25 billion Swedish crowns, is a guarantee for a higher level of military capability to 2025 compared with 2021 and we have today a better capability in, in the armed forces than we have 2014 when we started this new trend. So I think that we, we, we will be better in the future and we have money for, for, for this process in the, until 25. Uh -huh. And of course, uh, the Gripen, uh, the latest version of the Gripen, the E-model, uh, has already been accepted into service uh, in Brazil. You have first delivery of it and it's going to be entering service, or you're about to get delivery of it and it's going to enter service next year. Uh, but bring us up to speed on your key modernization priorities as well. Yes, uh, Gripen Jet Fighters is one of our key factors in our armed forces. We have said that uh, uh, the jet fighters and the submarines, they are uh, national security interests. So that is something that are very connected to the deep interest of the Swedish state. So we will support that these two systems also in the future. And um, uh, we are a small country, but we have the capability to produce both submarines and jet fighters. And we are very proud of that. But we also have prepared for the next generation after Yours Grip and E version. We have a new agreement, FCAS, with Great Britain around this, and that is that we will start to look at what will happen after 2040. So, so we have a long term perspective how to de develop jet fighters and still have the competence in Sweden. And, uh, of course, that's with uh, Italy. Uh, last question, which is uh, long-range strike. Uh, A-26 submarines are a tremendous capability that are coming into the Swedish Navy, uh, something that the Swedish Navy has always prided itself on, is having a first-class submarine force, uh, just like a first-class air force. And I think the Army guys would be pretty proud of uh, the ground capability as well. But I know that there were discussions where you're doing uh, the RB-15 missile and new generations of it to give you extended range. And there was also a discussion about equipping, for example, the submarines with a Tomahawk capability. Capability. Can you give us a little bit of an update in terms of what the sort of strategic capability that you're trying to develop at a time when Russia is being increasingly provocative? There have been discussions and speculations from different parts about uh, the weapon equipment, but uh, I will not go into that. We, we, we have the equipment we have and we have what we have officially declared. But uh, time goes by and you must also invest in new equipment. So one of the most uh, biggest investments we have done now is that we have decided to have Patriot system for air defense and that will upgrade the Swedish air defense systems to a very huge level compared to what we have today. And that is a very good thing we have done with United States and we also have a plan for deliverance, we have education of the people that are going to handle it and we prepare for that in now and we will get these uh, uh, systems uh, delivered in the first uh, half of 2020. So. 2020-2025. Peter Holquist, Sweden's Defence uh, Minister. Sir, always an honour and pleasure. Thank you very much and uh, glad to see you in slightly cloudy California. <laughs> Thank you so much. Nice to meet you.